My dear brothers and sisters, it brings me great pleasure to be able to meet with you on this 21st day of Jumad al-Akhirah in the year 1414 after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which is equivalent to the 4th of December 1993. The topic which has been given to me or requested of me to address is a topic of great importance as it is the most important topic in our Islamic faith. And that is the topic of recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His names and His attributes, and how is correct faith in Allah's name and His attributes. <coughs> this topic, by Allah's mercy and merit, I've been able to discuss this topic by Allah's mercy and merit, a number of times in the last year in different locations. So therefore, I chose for this setting to discuss this topic in a means which I had not spoken previously about. And the reason why is because of the uh, those other times I had spoken about this topic, uh, it was also taped and so forth, and so that it wouldn't be repetitious and more knowledge could be spread uh, among the community. Uh, the first time I was able to speak about this topic was in Colorado after Eid, when I discussed the Tawheed of the Prophets and the Messenger. And the second time in August in London, when I spoke and commented on Ibn Taymiyyah's Aqidah, or his creed which you penned, which is known as an Aqidah al Wafafiyah. This time, I have chosen to take another work by Ibn Taymiyyah and discuss it with us, with the brothers, uh, for while we are here. The work which I have chosen is Ibn Taymiyyah's response to the question posed to him by the inhabitants of Hama. Hama is a city in Syria, and it's known as Al Aqid al Hamawiya. Sometimes it's called the Creed of Hama, or it's sometimes called as uh, the Fatwa of Hama or the Jawab of Hama. The point is, is that Ibn Taymiyyah was asked questions concerning faith in Allah, his names and his attributes, by the inhabitants of the city. So he wrote to them a detailed response. This detailed response is, is quite lengthy and was later abridged by a contemporary scholar in our time, a great scholar of Ahlul Jama'ah, Muhammad bin Salih al utaymin So what I've decided to do is to take this book which is enriched, abridged by Ibn Uthameen, Al-Aqid al hamawiya and explain it uh, in this gathering. And Ibn Timi addresses the issue of, of Allah's names and attributes in it, and I feel that this will be uh, most beneficial for our setting. As I've explained the topic from other angles uh, in other settings, and not to be repetitious. So, to proceed with the... Uh, uh, the book, but before I would like to proceed with the book, I'd like to have a brief introduction, which I discussed last time when I was with you after Ramadan. That we must know that the Tawheed, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the prophets and the messengers with, is two types. All the prophets are, have the same religion, and this is the religion of Islam. Because Islam is two senses to the word Islam. Before we say that, let us explain what the word Islam means. Islam means to submit, al-Islam, and it also means to submit purely to Allah, al-Ikhlaq. Somebody to ask, what does the word Islam mean? So it has two meanings, al-Islam, submission, and al-Ikhlaq, pure submission. So therefore you submit only to Allah and to none else. This Islam is known as the general Islam, and this is the Islam which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent all the prophets to it all the prophets with. And it is this Islam which Allah is referring to in his verse in Surah Al Imran, in the deen and Allah in Islam. That the religion with Allah is Islam. It means this general Islam. And likewise, Allah in Surah Al Imran says, وَمَن يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلْ مِنْهُ وَفُهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ That whoever seeks any other religion besides Islam, it will not be accepted from him, and he will be in the hereafter among the losers, meaning he will be in the hellfire. This is the general Islam, which means to submit to Allah and to submit only to him. 
Opposing this Islam is two things. Opposing this Islam is two things. What are those two matters? The first matter is to submit to Allah and to submit to others with Allah, which is known as shirk, to associate others, to have partners with Allah. So you submit to Allah and you also submit to others with Allah, like the Christians, who tomorrow, when they get up in the morning and they will wear their best clothes on Sunday and take a bath and so forth, they will go to their churches to worship Allah, but they will associate either Ace of the Medium, uh, Jesus the Son of Mary, or uh, the saints and so forth as their Catholics with Allah in their prayer. This sin Allah will not forgive. In Allah la yaghfir an yushrak bihi wa yaghfir ma duna dhalika liman yasha. Allah does not forgive the sin of committing shirk with him, so making to him and others with him, but he'll forgive any other sin to whomever he pleases. Also against Islam in this general sense is what? Arrogance. If he said that Islam means to submit to Allah and to submit purely to him. So if you submit to Allah and you submit to others, this is nullifying Islam. But what happens if you refuse to submit initially? Neither submitting to Allah alone purely or neither submitting to Allah and others. Which is shirk. You refuse to submit to Allah. This is known as kibar or istikbar. And this is also against um, Islam. It nullifies Islam. And Allah concerning these people has said in Surah Ghafir, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْثِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ That those who are arrogant, those who are proud or boastful from worship, my worship, from worshiping me, they will enter into the hellfire humiliated, humiliated. So Islam, which is the religion of all the prophets, which is the religion which Allah has created us for, which is the religion of the angels, is this general in the general sense, this is Islam. And against it are what? Two things. Shirk, to submit to Allah and to submit to others, or to refuse to submit to Allah initially. Islam meaning to submit to Allah and submit to Him purely alone. That's what Islam means. It doesn't mean that, you know, you find in these books and so forth, Islam means peace. No, it doesn't mean, Islam does not mean peace. Yes, when a person is going to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and a society submits to Allah alone, among the benefits of it is that there is peace and there's not strife and conflict. But this is not the meaning of the word Islam. Okay? And this is why the, near the Day of Judgment, when Ace of the Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary, will return back to the earth, and as the Prophet ﷺ said, that he will return as a Muslim ruler, a just Muslim ruler, as mentioned in the Hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, and that he will break the cross, meaning that he will nullify Christianity. The Christians will, you know, recognize that he is not the son of Allah, but he's a prophet of Allah, and therefore they will enter into the village of Islam, and he will also drop the jizya, meaning that he will not accept from any of humankind, of mankind, except to be Muslims or the sword. And also he will annihilate the pig or exterminate the pig, meaning that he will, uh, this species of animal will be slaughtered and removed from the face of the earth. At that time, the, some of the hadith mentioned that when the people will be living and Ethan Rani will be the khalifa or the ruler of the Muslims at that time, it will be a time of great peace and blessing on earth. Uh, the the, uh, the people will at that time to make one sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one prostration, will be more greater in their hearts, more important than the whole world and what is in it, and wealth and riches and so forth. And the uh, Prophet ﷺ describes during that time that the wolf will guard the sheep. You see, I mean, normally the nature of the wolf is to eat the sheep, but this time the wolf will guard the sheep. And children will play with snakes and the snakes will not bite them and a, uh, a, a, a piece of fruit will, will suffice a whole family, and a goat would suffice a whole tribe of people. Why? Because Allah will put all the blessings into the plants and into the earth and into the rivers and so forth, because everybody will be worshipping him alone, and they will not have any uh, shift, and therefore there will be no strife. So Allah will send his blessings upon the people of the earth. So yes, this peace is from Islam in the sense that it's one of the things that results when people practice Islam, when they worship Allah alone. But it doesn't mean, Islam doesn't mean peace. It means to submit to Allah and to submit only to Allah. So this is the general Islam. The specific Islam is that which Allah sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with. So it's the general Islam which all the Prophets have. And the specific Islam is that which Allah sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with. This specific Islam is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sharia. It's his law. It's his sunnah, his way. After the sending of the Prophet Muhammad there is no 
choice for any human being, indeed for any of the jinns, except that they must enter into the Sharia of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And therefore for us who were born after the sending of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, indeed all of mankind to a day of judgment, for them, when we come to the verse in the Deen and Allah Islam, that religion with Allah is Islam, it means not just the religion in the general sense, Islam in the general sense, but also means in a specific sense, that they have to accept the Sharia of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that if we were to imagine that there were people who were following their teachings of their prophets before purely and unadulterated. I mean, somebody was holding on to Christianity as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it to Isa the Maryam with no additions or deletions to it. Or somebody was holding on to Judaism as Allah sent it down to the Prophet Moses with no additions or deletions or uh, corruptions. Then therefore, this is not accepted of them. It's not accepted of them. So the point is, is that Allah, Islam is the religion of Allah and Allah sent all the prophets with Islam, and that the greatest characteristic of the religion of the prophet is Tawheed. Tawheed. And Tawheed has two parts, as I mentioned before. There is a Tawheed in one's belief, and a Tawheed in one's deeds. A Tawheed in one's belief, and a Tawheed in one's deeds. Tawheed in belief means how we believe concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most Muslims recognize the most basis of this Tawheed, in the sense that most Muslims will recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, unlike the atheists. This is one aspect of Tawheed and belief. Most Muslims will recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, and he's not a trinity in his essence. This is, again, unlike the Christians, this is among the basics of the Tawheed. Most Muslims will recognize that Allah is the creator and the sustainer and so forth. This is one aspect of this Tawheed. But when you come to the other aspects of this Tawheed, Tawheed in one's belief, Tawheed in the heart, how we believe concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you find the Muslims are quite confused. You can come to any masjid, any mosque, and ask the people, where's Allah? And unless the people have been taught by a person uh, upon the Sunnah, or the people are still upon their fitrah, the natural state of Allah's state, then most people will say Allah is everywhere. And this belief is disbelief, in fact. This, this, this thought, this concept that Allah is everywhere, in fact, is disbelief and negates his Tawheed and belief. So, that's one aspect of Tawheed. The second aspect of Tawheed is Tawheed in worship. In the sense that once you recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know his names and his attributes, you must then direct all your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not direct any worship to anybody else, neither to an angel, neither to a prophet, or a sense messenger, neither to a righteous man, or much less to a rock, a cave, a stone, a river, a spring, or so forth. And much of mankind has directed their acts of worship to other than Allah. For those brothers who have, uh, uh, who come originally from Muslim countries, or for those brothers who have witnessed, visited Muslim countries, they will see that many Muslims in many of these major countries, in the Muslim countries in their major cities, they all have graves which they uh, direct their worship to. And these graves are much like idols, even though those people might be initially uh, religious people or righteous people. However, the people have overpraised them and have raised them to a status which only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they've directed to these men some acts of worship, like prayer, uh, like vowing, like slaughtering, like uh, going around their graves in, in a circumambulation, like one should go around the Kaaba and so forth and so on. This Type, two types of Tawheed the Prophet Sallallahu used to stress always. And you can see this even in his most, you might say, most elementary of his Sunnah. And I'll give you an example. What was the Prophet Sallallahu practice to read uh, for his two rakahs of Salat al Fajr, Sunnah al Fajr? What, what, what would he used to read? Does anybody know? Kafirun and Ikhlas, right, as the brother said. And also in Salat al Maghrib. And also when he would finish his Tawaf going around the Kaaba, and there's two rakahs which one does after that, behind the Maqam Ibrahim, behind the Sajjah Ibrahim, he would also recite these two surahs. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ and قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ Both of these surahs are known as surahs al-ikhlaq. And both of them stress one aspect of Tawheed. Both of them stress one aspect of Tawheed. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ describes Allah and His names and His attributes. This is the Tawheed of belief. And قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لا أعبد ما تعبدون 
Say, O oh, Muhammad Sallallahu to these disbelievers, I do not worship what you worship, nor do you worship what I worship. This describes the Tawheed indeed in worship, that only Allah can be worshipped. So here you find the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his most elementary of his sunnah, in these two rak'ahs, which one does before Salat al-Fajr, or does after Salat al-Maghrib, or after going around the Kaaba behind the station of Ibrahim, he would stress both aspects of Tawheed. How? By reciting these two surahs. Each of them embodies one aspect of Tawheed, of the two aspects of Tawheed. And likewise, if you reflect upon the Qur'an, you will find that the Qur'an either discusses this aspect of Tawheed or that aspect of Tawheed. In fact, we may summarize the Qur'an, that the Qur'an is basically five types of verses, five types of verses in the Qur'an, as Ibn Qayyim mentioned. The first type of verses are those verses which describe Allah's names and His attributes, and there are quite many, like, Qudhu Allahu Ahad, like the uh, conclusion of Surah Al-Hasha, where Allah mentions a lot of His names, like the beginning of Surah Al-Hadid, the Surah which is sometimes translated as Iron, uh, which Allah mentions some of His names, and so forth, and so on, from the Qur'an. Likewise, we find that uh, the second aspect of uh, the verses of the Qur'an are those aspects which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells mankind to worship Him alone, tells Him to worship Him alone. The first order in the Qur'an, if you start from Surah Al-Fatiha, and you continue reading it until you come to the first order you find around verse 20 in Surah Al-Baqarah, the first order comes, O mankind, worship your Lord. This is the first order in the Qur'an. Because this is the most important aspect of the religion of Islam. This is the second type of verses in the Qur'an. Those verses which tell and command mankind to worship Him alone. Allah alone. The third type of verses in the Qur'an are those verses which mention the specific acts of worship, specific acts of worship. And this is an implementation of this command to worship Allah alone. And these are the verses that mention either certain commands or certain prohibitions. Certain commands or certain prohibitions. The fourth, the fourth uh, type of verses in the Quran are those verses which, are those verses which Allah informs us of how he rewarded those who worship him alone and obey his prophets in this world and how he will reward them in the hereafter. In this, uh, in this uh, uh, world and in the hereafter. And these are the different stories we find in the Quran. And the fifth and final uh, verse, uh, in the type of verses in the Quran or category of verses are those verses which Allah mentions how he punished the disbelievers those who refuse to worship him, or worship him and others with him, and disobey his prophet. How he punished him in this world, and how he will punish him in the hereafter. So therefore, this was just a brief introduction to say that the religion of the prophets is all Islam, that Islam means to submit and to submit only to Allah, that against Islam is either to submit to Allah and to submit to others with Allah, or to refuse to submit to Allah initially. And that this, the greatest aspect of Islam is Tawheed, and Tawheed has two parts. Tawheed in one's belief, and Tawheed in one's deeds. And that the Qur'an in its entirety revolves around the subject of Tawheed, has five types of verses. Those that describe Allah as the first type, those that order us to worship Allah alone, the second type of verses. The third type of verses, those verses that have specific commands and prohibitions, which is the implementation of the command to worship Allah. The fourth type of verses are those how Allah dealt with those who worshipped Him alone and how in this world and in the hereafter. And the fifth type of verses about those verses how Allah dealt with those who refused to worship Him alone in this world and in the hereafter. And with this, I will uh, conclude this introduction to allow the brothers to uh, call Adan, I guess. Alhamdulillah. Uh -huh. <coughs> والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد So before uh, prayer we had a brief introduction and now I'd like to actually enter into the topic of this work This work was written by Ibn Taymiyyah in the year 698 698 So we are studying a work now which was written almost 716 years ago. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote this work between Zuhr and Asr in a single sitting. 
a question appear to him from the inhabitants of Hama, which is a city, as I said, in Syria. And the city was in Damascus. And he was asked concerning what is the position of the scholars concerning the, those verses and those statements of the Prophet ﷺ which mention or that mention Allah's attributes. So he began to write this essay. And uh, the essay has been printed in about 83, 90 pages and so forth, depending upon the printing. It's all about 90 pages. And he wrote it in one sitting between Wuhan and Alpha. As a result of this essay, he it resulted in the wrath of the state and also of the scholars of that time against them, who were basically proponents of the Ash'ari Metaf, which explain away or allegorically interpret Allah's names and attributes. So as a result of this, they made an inquisition to Ibn Taymiyyah's belief. They imprisoned him uh, some couple years after that, and they made an inquisition in the debate. And during that time, uh, the scholars, the Ash'ari scholars of Ibn Taymiyyah's debate, and Ibn Taymiyyah challenged them to respond, to find any argument, any evidence of proof from the first three centuries of Islam which supports their belief. And he gave them a period of time. I believe he gave them seven years or three years, I'm not certain. And now it's been, uh, if he, whether he gave them three years or he gave them seven years to get these proofs, it's now been seven centuries. And they still haven't been able to uh, respond to this argument. Anyway, the point is this is a, a work of great value. And the reason why I chose this as opposed to choosing uh, other uh, works was because, as I mentioned earlier in the first session, there's other works like an Aqid to the Wafafiyah. I explained it with some detail in London, and the, the cassettes are available. Not here in the United States right now, but hopefully soon. And likewise, I explained um, a book written by Ibn Uthaymin, or parts of this book written by Ibn Uthaymin, concerning uh, rules for understanding, uh, or rules or principles for faith in Allah's names and attributes in London, uh, in, um, in Colorado, uh, after uh, after uh, Ramadan, uh, after Eid uh, Ramadan, of, uh, after Eid al Kabir, or before Eid al Kabir, excuse me, uh, in May, last May. And so that also is available. So I decided to choose this book. So inshallah, what we'll do now is until the next session breaks, and if the brothers get tired, you can just tell me, or the sisters, we'll, we can take a break before that. I think the next session will, the session should end around three, and we'll just start the book. So uh, the, what we're doing is we're taking Ibn Uthaymiyyah's abridgment. So it's not the actual uh, text of Ibn, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. The first thing that Ibn Uthaymiyyah or Ibn Taymiyyah starts off with is providing us a certain important rule which we need to understand concerning any topic of the faith of Islam. And in particular concerning the faith uh, in Allah's names and attributes. Ibn Taymiyyah writes, that it is required upon every single slave of Allah, whether male or female, uh, whether Arab or not Arab, that he must follow whatever Allah or his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has said. And likewise, he must follow the rightly guided successors of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who are rightly guided in their beliefs and in their deeds, and their followers, and their followers. So every single Muslim must follow whatever Allah says, whatever the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said, whatever the rightly guided successors of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who are rightly guided in their belief and in their deeds, have said, and these are the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's companions, and those people who have followed them, it's required for every Muslim to follow whatever they have said, and that is because Allah has sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the guidance. And he has required upon all of mankind to believe in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and believe in the guidance which Allah sent the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with. And to follow that guidance inwardly and outwardly. Inwardly in one's belief, in one's state of one's heart, in terms of one's fear of Allah, love of Allah, hope of Allah's mercy, and outwardly in terms of his behavior, in his act of worship, and so forth and so on. One must follow this guidance, both inwardly and outwardly. The evidence to this is Allah's statement in Surah Al-A'raf, the seventh surah of the Quran. Allah says, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ 
إني رسول الله إليكم جميعا الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض لا إله إلا هو يحي ويميت فآمنوا بالله ورسوله النبي الأمي الذي يؤمن بالله وكلماته واتبعوه لعلكم تهتدون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the verse we might translate it as, say, say, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to all of mankind, verily, I am the messenger of Allah who has been sent to all of you, whether you're Arab or non-Arab, whether you're black or white, whether you were born in the century of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or will come afterwards until the day of judgment, he has been sent to all of us. Whether you previously have a scripture, you were previously a Jew or a Christian, or you were a pagan and having no religion before. And the one who has sent me, Allah, He is the one who has the dominion or owns everything which is in the heavens and the earth. I Meaning there's nothing in the universe except for that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created it and owns it. And that there is none worthy of worship except for Him. He is the one who gives life and causes death. So believe in Allah and His Messenger, the illiterate prophet. His messenger, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has described him as the illiterate prophet because the Prophet ﷺ could neither read nor write. Who himself, meaning the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, believes in Allah and his word, meaning believes in the Quran which has been sent to him. And follow him, follow the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, that perhaps you might become guided. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it the rule that it is upon every single one, every single one of the human race, since the sending of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to either to that they must obey the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by believing him and following him. Now we mentioned that one must believe in what Allah says, his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, and also he said the rightly guided successor after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who are rightly guided in their belief and their deeds. So what's the proof for this third group of category, the third category which we've added? The proof is the statement of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah has commanded us to believe in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said for us to follow the guidance of the rightly guided successors after him in their belief and their deeds. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith, part of the hadith mentions, "Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al-khulafa al-rashidin al-mahdiyin min ba'di tamasku biha wa'adu alayha bil nawajiz wa iyaakum wa muhaddisat al-umur fa inna kull muhaddisat bid'a." وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل بدعة ضلالة. Here the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has said, it is incumbent upon you to follow my sunnah, my way. And the sunnah of those rightly guided successors after me. خلفاء الراشدين المهديين من بعدي. خلفاء من سكسر. Full of the word خليفة, which means successor. And the Prophet ﷺ has described them as Rashidin and as Mahdiyin. Rashidin and Mahdiyin are similar words in Arabic. But one refers to me that they are guided in their belief. That's Rashidin, means that their belief, their way is a guided way. And Mahdiyin refers to in their deeds, in their actions, that they're guided in their actions. So that's why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that they are Rashidin, Mahdiyin. So they're guided in their beliefs and in their actions, in their deeds and in their uh, their words and in their deeds. The Prophet ﷺ here told us to, uh, informs us we must adhere to this sunnah of his and the sunnah of the rightly guided successors after him who are rightly guided in their beliefs and their deeds and we must hold on to this and cling on to it with all our might and that we should be aware of introductions into the religion for every introduction is a bid'ah or a heresy and every heresy is a deviation from that straight path which Allah has sent the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ with. Now, here the Prophet ﷺ said that the most, he said, follow the sunnah of the rightly guided successors after me. The rightly guided successors after me. In belief and deed. The most deserving of mankind to this description are whom? The Prophet's companions. The Prophet's companions. They are the most of mankind who follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And of all of mankind, they are the most guided in terms of their beliefs and their deeds. And that's why we find another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ describes the saved group on the Day of Judgment. Because we know that the Prophet ﷺ informed us that this ummah, this community of his, those who have responded to the call 
that he is the messenger of Allah, would divide. And the division between them would be more severe and greater than that of the previous communities who were before the community of Islam, of the, of the community, those who responded to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he's the messenger of Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Verily the Jews and Christians divided upon 71 or 72 groups. And that this community of mine, in his ummah, would divide into 73 groups, all of which would go to hell except for one. One asked, one question, as to who the identity of, what was the identity of that saved group, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied what? He says that they are those who are upon the same, the like of what he is upon today, and his companions, and his companions. So here the Prophet ﷺ tells us to adhere to his sunnah, and the sunnah of the rightly guided successors after him in belief and deed. And in his other hadith, he says that the saved group in the Day of Judgment are those who are upon that which he is upon, and his companions. So we understood from this then, therefore, that those who are the rightly guided successors in belief and deed, are his companions. So the point is, is that the point is that the most deserving of mankind to this description of Al-Khurafa Al-Rashidin Al-Mahniyin and Min Ba'di are whom? The Prophet's companions. Indeed, the Prophet ﷺ testified that they were the best of mankind. He said in a hadith mentioned in Bukhari and elsewhere that the best of mankind was his generation, then those who followed that generation, then those who followed that generation. Yeah. Well, the in the draft, so. I know, I know, I'll be glad to move up. Okay. Excuse me, let's take a break for a minute. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam rasulullah wa ba'ad. So we were mentioning that the it is required upon every single Muslim to follow what Allah has said, to follow what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu has said, and to follow what the rightly guided successors in their belief and in their deeds uh, said also. And we identified that the rightly guided successors after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are whom? The Prophet's companions. And it was for this reason that Allah chose these men to be the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah did not choose us who have gathered in this mosque, uh, this message this afternoon, to be among the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah guided us and blessed us that we are among the followers of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and among the followers of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's companions. At least we hope from Allah that. But Allah did not choose us to be among the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because obviously we are not men of that caliber to deserve that great blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. One should not imagine that he, no matter how much his prayer no matter how much his fasting, no matter how much his knowledge, or his love, or even his jihad, whatever act of the act of Islam is, that he equals that of the Prophet's companions. They were a generation which there is no comparison to. Indeed, they are the best of mankind, as I had mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, the best of mankind was his generation. And therefore, we did not get this honor because we were not men of that caliber. We were not men of that caliber. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most wise. And he does not do anything except for a wisdom. So Allah chose these men to support the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa because they were the best of mankind and they were therefore, their, their minds and their bodies and their souls were more uh, deserving of this uh, honor. Yeah. Now, the message of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the message of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is basically, you can divide it into two categories. It, con- it consists of two things. What are those two things? It consists of useful knowledge, and it consists of righteous action. Al-ilm al-nafi' wal-amal al-salih. What's the evidence? The evidence is from the Quran. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, 
هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق والذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون It is he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has sent his messenger with the guidance and the true religion that he may manifest it upon over all religions that it may prevail over all other religions even if the mushrikun, those who worship others with Allah hate that are adverse to that fact so Allah in this verse mentions that he sent the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with two things with al-huda with the guidance and with al-deen al-haq al-deen al-haq which is the true religion the guidance means that useful knowledge and the true religion means righteous action al-amal al-salih useful knowledge is that knowledge which comes from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the righteous not action, the righteous action is that action which is done solely for Allah in accordance to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Indeed, the useful knowledge, al-ilm al-nathir, is encompasses everything which is beneficial for this community, for this ummah, whether in the matters of the hereafter or in the matters of their worldly affairs or the worldly affairs. All of this has been brought by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Of this useful knowledge, the essence of it and the most important aspect of it and the heart of it is what? Knowledge of Allah by knowledge of His names and His attributes. This is the greatest issue of Iman, of faith. And this is the greatest issue of Ibadah. And it is for this reason why Allah has created us. Allah has created us for, to worship Him. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And one cannot worship Allah unless he knows Allah. He knows His names and His attributes. And therefore the essence of the useful knowledge which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with, the essence of the guidance which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa with, the heart of the Islamic religion is knowledge of Allah's names and attributes. Allah. Knowledge of Allah's names and attributes. For this reason, it is impossible, <coughs> it is impossible for us to imagine that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa left this topic of Allah's names and attributes unaddressed. I mean, this is the heart of the Islamic religion. And this is the, the aim of revelation. And this is the purpose for what Allah created us for. That we may know Him so that we may worship Him alone. Is it conceivable then that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left this topic unexplained? Confusing? Confused or so forth? This is an impossibility. But rather we are certain that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have explained this issue, this topic, to such a degree, it would leave no doubt in the mind of those who heard this explanation as to what is correct faith concerning Allah's names and attributes. And we can show this by a number of ways. And let me uh, start with the first way. The first way is that we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the light. He describes his message, the revelation as light, and describes it as guidance, as huda. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as sending him to give glad tidings and also to warn. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a caller to his uh, path by his permission. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like he's a blazing lamp. A blazing lamp. So that a person may be able to find his path in the darkness of disbelief. Indeed, the Prophet ﷺ described that he has Indeed, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ has described that he has sent, that he has left his ummah upon that road which is white and shining and that night is equal to daytime on that road. For instance, we were traveling last night on the path, the road was dark. Had it not been for those uh, lights 
uh, on the road, on the highway, we would have, might have very easily gotten off the path and head, you know, into a destruction. The Prophet ﷺ left his ummah upon Nahj al upon a road which is so white and clear and shining that night and day are the same. There's no night, there's no day, there's no darkness to it. So therefore, whoever swerves from that path is heading into destruction. Is heading into destruction. The greatest matter, the greatest light, the greatest guidance, again, is knowledge of Allah, to recognize Allah by knowing His name, His attributes, and His actions. So therefore, it is impossible for us, except that we must be certain that the Prophet ﷺ explained this issue clearly, leaving no doubt in the minds of those who heard his explanation concerning this topic. The second issue is that we know that the Prophet ﷺ explained to his ummah everything which they need to know concerning matters of this world and matters during the hereafter. Indeed, the Prophet ﷺ even taught us the adab, the manners of how to eat and drink, how to sit, how to sleep, and even how to defecate. Even how to defecate. We know, for instance, the Prophet ﷺ told us that we should only drink with our right hands or eat with our right hands. We should not eat or drink with the left hand. The Prophet ﷺ even told us that when we defecate, we should not clean ourselves, or a man should not hold his private parts with his right hand, but should rather do it with his left hand. Is it conceivable that, the, and also like when we sleep, we should sleep on our right side and not on our left side. I mean, all these small matters of behavior and so forth, concerning these mundane, worldly things like eating and drinking and sleeping and defecating and so forth. Is it conceivable that the Prophet by sudden would legislate for us a way and a code for these matters and leave faith in Allah and His names and His attributes confusing, unexplained? This is inconceivable. And this is why the Prophet's companions like Abu Dhar mentioned that there is not a single bird flapping its wings in the heavens except for the Prophet Muhammad has given us some knowledge concerning it. I Meaning there's nothing in the world, in the universe, concerning Allah, concerning the Day of Judgment, the matters of the unseen, or concerning the matters of the seen, except that we have guidance from the Prophet Muhammad uh, concerning that. And no doubt that in this knowledge, enters knowledge of Allah's names and attributes and His actions, and so forth, and so forth, on. The third manner we may answer this is that, as we mentioned, that knowledge of Allah's names and attributes and actions is the essence and the aim of revelation. So if this is the essence and aim of revelation, would Allah therefore leave the most important aspect of revelation untouched and unexplained and unclear? That is an impossibility. Likewise, we know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi has certain characteristics concerning him. He is the most knowledgeable of mankind concerning Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said in a hadith of Sahih Bukhari that I am more knowledgeable than any of you concerning Allah. Likewise, the second aspect is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is the most concerned of all of mankind concerning the guidance of mankind. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ was so concerned that mankind would respond to his message that Allah would sometimes uh, censure the Prophet in the Quran. Allah would sometimes censor the Prophet in the Quran for being over concerned concerning the guidance of mankind. And he would say to him words of the effect, if you read in the Quran, that you shouldn't, you know, I mean, be concerned if these people do not want to believe. That if Allah wanted to guide them, He would have guided them. And therefore, it's not any fault of yours. But this is the way of all the prophets, that some people respond to their message, and they are the minority, and the majority will reject the message. So the point is, is that the Prophet Muhammad is what? He is the most knowledgeable of mankind concerning Allah. He is the most concerned concerning the guidance of mankind, from mankind. And likewise, the third quality, he is the most truthful of mankind. 
And the fourth quality is that he is the most... Uh, He is the most pure in speech, the most pure in speech, and the most clear in speech of mankind. So the Prophet has gained, has gathered with him all these qualities. So therefore we cannot imagine that the Prophet was disregarded the most important matter of, of faith, of revelation, right? Because the Prophet we, we said that Iman, faith in Allah, faith in Allah, is the most important matter of the religion, of revelation. So if the Prophet Sallallahu would he then therefore disregard the most important matter, I mean of his own, and not explain to people, this is an impossibility. Is it possible the Prophet Sallallahu was ignorant concerning this prophet, concerning Allah and his attributes? This is an impossibility. Is it possible the Prophet Sallallahu was unable to explain it clearly? The explanation of the Prophet Muhammad must be complete concerning this topic. So do you see how we've now set up a chain of narration? We've shown that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the aim of his revelation, to explain Allah's names and attributes. And the Prophet, it is inconceivable for us to imagine that he would have left this topic un untouched. And we've shown this now in, in five ways. In five or four ways. Now we come to the companions, those who re received the Prophet Sallallahu explanation concerning Allah's names and attributes. We know for certain that they must have spoken truth concerning this topic. Because had they not spoken truthfully concerning this topic, it would have been one of two reasons. Either because if they were silent, in other words, they were, they were neglectful. That the Prophet also explained to them faith concerning Allah and His names and His attributes and His actions, and they were neglectful. They didn't carry that explanation of the Prophet to the next generation after them. This is one possibility. The second possibility is that they heard the explanation of the Prophet but they willfully decided not to explain or to convey that explanation of the Prophet This is the second possibility. If we're to say, if we're to claim that they didn't speak truthfully, both of these are false possibilities. Why? Because if they were silent, it's either one of two reasons. They were either silent because they were ignorant, and we've shown that they are the most knowledgeable of mankind, and they are the best of mankind, or they were silent because they could care less. And if we look at their history, and their lives, and how much they spent to spread this religion, and how much they put efforts to spread even the minor, not the minor, I want to say, but the um, the, the, the minute uh, practices of the Prophet Muhammad how would they then leave the most important matter of revelation? This is an Im Im impossible for us to imagine. Likewise, we cannot imagine that they were ignorant. Because if they were ignorant, then therefore the Prophet would have failed in his message to teach them. Allah in the Quran says concerning the Prophet Muhammad that he teaches them the book and the wisdom, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So if they were ignorant, they couldn't understand, either because the Prophet ﷺ didn't explain it to them, couldn't teach them well, or because they were not intelligent enough to understand the Prophet ﷺ, which would be Allah's fault for choosing them to be his companions. And this is an impossibility. And likewise, to say that they willfully wanted to lead mankind astray, or that they willfully, uh, you know, uh, were neglectful in spreading the message or that they were ignorant, all of these are impossible because whoever looks at the history of the Prophet's companions is certain that in whatever they said or did, they only would try to adhere to the Qur'an and to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad and they gave everything they had from their lives and everything that Allah gave them to spread the religion of Islam and spread even the most minute details of the Prophet and Sunnah. This introduction is very important. Because only if you grasp this introduction which I've given in this last uh, hour or so, or less, uh, you can understand the topic which we want to discuss. Because the Ummah has differed concerning faith in Allah's names and attributes. And only if we establish that Allah explained this topic clearly, that the Prophet then explained this revelation to the Sahaba, to the Companions, and then the companions then conveyed that to the next generation, 
we cannot, we cannot then accept uh, the faith of Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah concerning this topic. And likewise, this is for every matter in the religion. For every matter in the religion. Unless you, unless you accept this rule, this principle, it is only then you will be able to accept anything of the way of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And why is that? Why is that? Because our faith is based upon the fact that I, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to guide us and therefore does not leave things confusing, does not leave things unexplained, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did convey the message and that the companions were the best of mankind and then took that message and conveyed it to the rest of mankind. You know, this has to be something very clear in the hearts and in the minds of all the brothers and sisters. There should be no doubt concerning this. And if there's any doubt, it's important that we get it out now rather than uh, wait later on because it will cause confusion in this topic. Also, we might see that those people who are against this principle, so the more firm you hold to this principle, the greater, more firm you hold to the true religion of Islam, as Allah sent the Prophet Muhammad them with. Because mankind concerning this principle are three groups. Are three groups. The first group are the philosophers. The philosophers claim that the Prophet Muhammad himself, and indeed all the Prophets were ignorant. They did not know what the truth was. So therefore they, they, they spoke basically a bunch of nonsense. You see? And among whom was Al-Farabi. Farabi is a uh, great philosopher in the sense of, uh, I mean greatness not in, uh, in the sense of our judgment, but in the sense of they judging themselves, you know. And uh, he was known for his uh, a work which he wrote was called al Medina Al-Fadila, or the... Um, uh, it's something like Plato's Republic, he wrote, uh, the uh, Virtuous City, Virtuous City. And also he was known for his, uh, for his he had uh, treaties on music and uh, different um, sounds and so forth. And he wrote in this work, al Madinat al-Fadila, that the prophets were all ignorant. And that basically they spoke nonsense. You know, that in whatever you, they were well-intending people, there's no doubt they're saying. Musa and Isa and Maryam and Muhammad Sallallahu were well-intending, but they didn't know what they were talking about. These people are obviously kuffar outside the fold of Islam. The second group of people are also philosophers, but they say, no, the prophets knew the truth, but uh, intentionally, willfully lied. They didn't want to explain the truth to mankind. And among whom who, who have, have this, or as well among the proponents of this idea, is Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina was a philosopher and a great doctor, but at the same time, he was, uh, as many of the ulama considered him a kafir, a disbeliever. Because he said the prophets willfully lied, and among whom the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came across a bunch of, you know, Bedouin, desert dwellers. These people neither, you know, had clothes on their back, nor did they know anything of civilization, and so forth. So therefore, how was he going to refine these Bedouin? Well, he made up things, like a, there was a lord upon his throne who was going to send a revelation to you and going to judge you, and he made up something called the Day of Judgment, and there's a heaven and a hell, in order to get these people to have refined their behavior, so they may have civilization and culture. Because they, had he just come to them with Greek philosophy and so forth, the way of Aristotle and Plato, they wouldn't have been able to accept it, because they're, you know, a bunch of Bedouin, what do they know about civilization and so forth. So therefore he made this up. This also is kufr and throws out a person outside of Islam. The third group of people, the third group of people, are Muslims, but they have accused the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions of treason. Of treason. And they say, yes, it's true that Allah, I mean, that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet and the Prophet's companions, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and the rest, knew the truth concerning Allah, His name, and His attributes, and concerning the matters of the last day. But they were willfully silent. They were willfully silent. And they did not explain this. And that in order for you to understand it, they left things sort of like this literal. The only way for you to understand it is that you either have to take one of two paths. Here they have a difference of opinion. Either you take the path of the mystic, the Sufi, and therefore after doing a certain number of spiritual exercises, one day it will become clear to you what the truth is. Or you take the path of the philosopher and you engage in reason and debate and logic and then you will eventually the truth will become clear to you. And this is the opinion of Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali, who died in the year 505 in his book, Ihya Ulum al-Din, 
or the revival of the, um, the sciences or the knowledge of the religion, which the scholars have correctly described as actually imagined to Urdu Medin. It causes death to the, uh, doesn't revive, it causes death to the, uh, the sciences of the religion. Because his argument in this book is that what? That there's no way for you to understand the truth of Allah's names and attributes or the matters of the last day by just reading the Quran and Sunnah. That if you were just to satisfy yourself with the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger, وسلم, you'd go astray. Because the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, willfully didn't want to explain this to mankind. Because he realized that he said, oh, mankind, they're not able to understand these things. You know, they're not able to comprehend this. And likewise, the Prophet's companions, they were too busy making jihad, fighting these kuffar and so forth, and also they realized that, you know, they wouldn't be, mankind would not be able to understand it. So, it's only left to the initiative of those few people in every generation, every century, who either don the Sufi cloak and go wander in the wilderness and so forth, and caves and trees and so forth, and, and therefore mountains, and then they become, you know, clear to them these realities, or those people who, you know, spend all night long reflecting and so forth and engage in some sort of mental exercise and use the rules on uh, regulations of philosophy, it will come to them the truth and so forth. We say that all three of these principles, all three of these premises are all falsehood. That the truth is what? What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conveyed to his companions, which then the companions then conveyed to the rest of mankind. And this is what our faith is. I mean, this has to be very clear. This, if you understand this principle, if you understand this principle, this will open your mind to understanding every single issue which there are differences concerning the Muslims. Whether it's dealing with matters of worship, whether it's dealing with matters of how to revive this religion and to make this religion uh, prominent against the disbelievers, or whether dealing with matters of faith and belief. So is this uh, clear in the minds of the brother before we go on? If there's any differences or any confusion, I'd like to now stop now and, 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 and uh, resolve that before we go further. So I take your silence as an acknowledgement. We have to wait now and see what happens in the question time. But uh, this, as it may uh, be, therefore we have now set this, these rules and these principles. We may now come to what is the faith of Ahl al Jama'ah concerning Allah's names and attributes concerning Allah's names, attributes, and actions. This faith is summarized in the following uh, principle or uh, uh, rule. And it is that, first of all, uh, I want to define, before I get to that, uh, define um, what do I mean by Ahl al Jama'ah. Ahl al Jama'ah is an Arabic phrase, an Arabic term, and it comprises basically of three important words. Ah, Sunnah, and Jama'ah. Ahl Sunnah, and Jama'ah. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, defining what does the, uh, the term Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah mean? Mean. And I'm saying that this Arabic phrase basically consists of three words, three important words in the sentence. And the first one is Ahlu. Ah means those people who are the followers, the adherents, okay? Sometimes it's translated as people, but that's not, it doesn't really give you the good understanding of it. Ahlu means the adherents or the followers. Followers of what? As Sunnah. The Sunnah is the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Sunnah doesn't just mean those extra acts that if you do them you're rewarded for and that if you disregard them you won't be punished for. Like praying two rak'ahs before Fajr or two rak'ahs before Maghrib. We call them the Sunnah prayers. This is not, mean, this is not what the word Sunnah means. Sunnah means that, literally means way. And here we mean the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whether dealing with matters of belief in the heart whether dealing with the actions of the heart, the acts of the heart in terms of fear, hope, um, um, uh, reliance and trust in Allah, love and so forth, whether dealing with acts of worship, whether dealing with behavior, whether dealing with the regulations of the religion in terms of how do we deal with one another and so forth and so on, deal with the disbelievers. This is all, the whole sharia is the Prophet of Sunnah. Sunnah and sharia here are equivalent terms. So Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They are also Jama'ah. Jama'ah means that people who are unified. And they are unified upon what? They're unified upon three matters. The first matter, they're unified upon the Sunnah. In the sense that they have gathered and assembled themselves and unified themselves upon the Sunnah 
of the Prophet Muhammad The second thing is that they have unified themselves upon the understanding of the earliest generation of the Muslims, which is their ijma', their unified consensus of the Prophet's companions in those early generations which the Prophet has praised. And the third aspect of them being the jama'ah is the sense that they have unified themselves in following those lawful rulers of the Muslim community. Because we know the Prophet forbade us to revolt against the ruler who is a Muslim so long as he has the quality of Islam. He hasn't become a disbeliever. Even if he is impious, even if he's sinful, even if he's tyrannical, the Prophet said, not to raise your, our, our, your swords against them until you see clear kufr, clear disbelief in which you have an evidence from Allah. And that is why from the, if you read the books of the people of the Sunnah, they always write and they pen in their creed that it is from the way of the people of the Sunnah that they make prayers and they perform the pilgrimage, the hajj, and they wait jihad with the imams of their, and imam here means the imam of the, of the Muslim nation, of the ummah. Whether these imams are pious or whether these imams are impious. Because their impiety reflects themselves and doesn't negate praying behind them as they lead us in prayer or making hajj with them or making jihad, waging jihad with them against our enemies. Okay? So this is what Ahl al Jama'ah means. They are those people who follow the Prophet ﷺ's sunnah inwardly and outwardly. And his sunnah here means his sharia. And they have gathered themselves upon the sunnah. They haven't divided or split off. And they have gathered themselves upon the understanding of the earliest Muslim. And they have gathered themselves behind the leaders of the Muslims. The leaders of the Muslims meaning whom? The imams of the Muslim as a country, not as meaning imams like in the masjid and so forth. Now, Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah's way, their rule, their principle concerning belief in Allah's names and attributes, may be defined as follows. It is to affirm whatever Allah has affirmed for himself in his book or upon the tongue of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without tahrif, without ta'afil, without taqyif, and without tamthif. And I'll explain each of these four terms, so bear with me. The point is, is that they affirm whatever Allah has affirmed for himself in his book, the Qur'an, or whatever the Prophet Muhammad has affirmed for Allah in the authentic sunnah, and that sunnah which we can confirm is the words of the Prophet avoiding these four deviant ways, and I'll explain each of those deviant ways. Tahrif, Ta'aqil, Taqif, and Tamseel. The point is, is that they affirm whatever Allah says about himself. In other words, if Allah says that this is from his name, that this name is among his names, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself that he is such, that this is one of his descriptions, one of his attributes. Or he says that this is one of his actions. Or the Prophet says that this is one of Allah's names. Or the Prophet says that this is one of Allah's descriptions or one of his actions. Ahl al Jama'ah affirms that. Why do they affirm that? Because Allah has spoken such. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallam has said such. Avoiding these four things of tahrif, ta'qil, shakif, and tamseed. And likewise, they negate, they negate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatever he has negated from himself in his book or whatever the Prophet has negated from Allah. And at the same time, they affirm the opposite. They affirm the opposite. They affirm the opposite. What do I mean by that? Allah has negated from himself injustice. Allah says that he is not, shows no injustice to the creation. So Ahl al Jama'ah negates from Allah any injustice, but they affirm the opposite and in the sense of perfection. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows no injustice because He is the most just and His justice is perfect. So they negate what Allah negates from Himself or what the Prophet has negated from Him while affirming the opposite in a sense of perfection. The third uh, rule concerning Ahl al Jama'ah, the third part of this rule, is that those names or attributes or actions, and in particular uh, attributes and actions, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has neither affirmed for himself in the Qur'an, nor the Prophet Muhammad has affirmed for Allah in the Sunnah, nor 
you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has negated from himself in the Quran and you, neither, and you find that the Prophet has not negated this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah do not either affirm or negate this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but rather they investigate into the meaning if the meaning is a true meaning they affirm the true meaning and if the meaning is a false meaning they negate that false meaning but the actual wording they neither affirm it nor negate it and they only affirm and negate what Allah has affirmed or negated from himself whether by way of the Quran or Sunnah so that's in general the rule and now I'd like to uh, come and explain it in, uh, in detail so this, that rule has three parts to it so we said the first part is they affirm what Allah has affirmed for himself or affirmed for the Prophet Sallallahu only from names and attributes and actions why? because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghayb unseen and there is no way for us to know what Allah's names are or his actions are or his attributes are unless Allah has revealed that to us the mind no matter how intelligent that person is and likewise the heart no matter how pious that heart is cannot recognize what Allah's names are or recognize what Allah's attributes are or his actions unless it's been mentioned by revelation there's no way and the evidence is in the Quran itself Allah in the Quran mentions in Surah Al-Faha وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِهِ عِلْمًا that they do not encompass him meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in knowledge so therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too great too magnificent too uh, glorious too lofty for any human being by just reasoning or by his sense in his heart to know what Allah's names or his attributes or his actions are. This is an impossibility. One may only know this by means of revelation. And so therefore the way of Ahl al Jama'ah is that they affirm what Allah has affirmed for himself. And they affirm whatever the Prophet Muhammad has affirmed for Allah. But when they affirm this to Allah they avoid four things. Tahrif, Ta'aqeed, Takif and Tamthil. And now I'll explain each of these four terms one by one. What is the first thing they avoid? They avoid, avoid Tahrif. Tahrif linguistically means to change or to deviate. Well, just understand the concept. The word is Tahrif. But it's important now to understand the concept more than the word itself. Tahrif linguistically means to change or to pervert or to deviate. And it has there are three types of tahrif. The first type of tahrif is to commit tahrif by uh, changing the uh, wording of the Quran of the Sunnah, but it doesn't change the meaning. And I'll give you an example. We know that Surah Al-Fatiha says, right, you say, Alhamdu Lillahi, right? So if somebody was to say Alhamda, Alhamda Lillahi, this is Tahrif. Because he now changed the wording of the Quran. The Quran was revealed saying Alhamdu Lillahi, not Alhamda Lillahi. Okay? But this Tahrif doesn't change the meaning of this verse. And usually this type of Tahrif, this type of changing of the Quran and the Sunnah, occurs by people who are ignorant ignorant of the Arabic language usually and so therefore when they are reading the Quran or the Sunnah or they're not fluent uh, not natural Arabic speakers so therefore they might mispronounce the word but their mispronunciation does not lead to actually a changing of the meaning this is one type of tahrif the second type of tahrif is a tahrif in the wording but also results in a changing of the meaning of the Quran and I'll give you an example along the Quran says وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا Allah spoke to Moses directly. The reason why is because it says Allahu. So it means Allah is the one who spoke by Arabic grammar. Those people who reject that Allah speaks, they, they change this verse by saying وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهَ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا So this changes the meaning of the verse. So instead of meaning that Allah spoke to Moses, it becomes that Moses spoke to Allah because they don't believe that Allah speaks so they want to negate this verse 
So they changed from Kalam Allahu Musa Taklima to Kalam Allaha Musa Taklima to perverse the meaning of the verse. And obviously, whoever does this intentionally, willfully, is a kafir, has left the fold of Islam. The third type of tahrif <coughs> is not a tahrif of the wording of the Quran or the Sunnah, but it is a tahrif only in the meaning. By you interpreting the Quran and the Sunnah unlike the interpretation which it was intended for. And I'll give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Ar Rahman wa ala arsh dawa. That Ar Rahman has risen or is above his throne. His throne. Upon his throne. So they change the meaning of the word istawa to istawla, which means he's conquered his throne. They so here they don't, they recite the verse properly. I mean, they recite the verse as it is in the, in the, in the, in the Quran, as it was revealed. They, they read it, Ar Rahman wa Arash Istawa. But when they come to interpret the word istiwa, they say istiwa doesn't mean it according to what it means in the Arabic language, which means that somebody's above or higher or special, they say no. It means that he has conquered. It's stola. They add the, the extra letter there in the interpretation. This type of tahrif, they like to call it, those who practice this like to call it ta'weed. Ta'weed, which means interpretation. And it's a false interpretation. In reality, it's tahrif. But they like to call it ta'weed, which is interpretation or explanation, to sort of, you know, give it some sort of currency, some sort of guide. And I'll, I'll have some words concerning that later on. So the point is, we affirm what Allah affirms to Himself, and what the Prophet ﷺ has affirmed for Allah, from names, attributes, and actions, without tahrif. And tahrif means without to changing that. Either the wording or the meaning of that. That's the first principle we avoid. The second one is what? Without ta'afid. Ta'afid literally means, in the English language, means to be something which is, you know, bare of its ornaments. Like, for instance, a woman who doesn't have a necklace around her neck or around her uh, bracelet, around her arm. She's dealt bare of her ornaments. She's stripped these ornaments from her. This is what ta'afi literally means in, uh, in the Arabic language. But in this sense, ta'afi means what? It means to negate from Allah his qualities of perfection his qualities of perfection by denying it so we affirm what Allah has affirmed for himself we affirm what the Prophet ﷺ has affirmed for Allah and we do not negate that we do not deny that we don't say well yes it's in the Quran but we don't want to believe in it this is ta'aqeel and ta'aqeel is two types concerning Allah's names and attributes Ta'aqeel in totality, and this is practiced by, like, the Jahmi and the Mu'tazila, which were two sects which denied all of Allah's attributes, without exception. Any attribute of Allah, sometimes they deny. They deny that Allah sees, they deny that Allah hears, they deny, deny Allah speaks, they deny Allah is above His throne, they deny that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a face, they deny Allah has two hands, two eyes, and so forth. This was in totality. Every attribute mentioned in the Qur'an, or in the Sunnah, they deny, they negate. And therefore, they've stripped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from His perfection. Likewise, the extremists among the Jahmiyyah even deny His name. They deny all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say, you cannot say that Allah is a Samir, the all hearing. You cannot say that Allah is al Basir, the all seeing. You cannot say that Allah is a Rahman, the one who is merciful by His nature, or al Rahim, the one who shows mercy to His creation. They deny all of Allah's names also. And likewise, there are some people who practice ta'afeen in partial. Not in totality, but in, in just in, in, in partial. And these are like the Ash'aris, al Ash'ariya, who only affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seven attributes. And they deny the rest, and they allegorically explain the rest, which they call ta'afeen, which is as we see now, it's tahrif. So therefore, they only affi affirm to Allah that He sees and He hears, and that He has life, and that He has a will, that's four attributes, and that He has an ability, five, and that He uh, speaks, even though the, the way they affirm speech to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not correct, and that He has knowledge. These are the only attributes they affirm for Allah. And the rest of the attributes, like mercy, anger, uh, having a face, that He's upon the throne, that He has two eyes, and so forth, they 
explained away. They allegorically interpret. They practice what they call ta'wib, but in actuality is ta'rif, or perverting the uh, meanings of the Qur'an and Sunnah. The third uh, way which we must avoid when we affirm to Allah whatever Allah has affirmed uh, to Himself, or what the Prophet has affirmed to Him in the names and attributes, is that which is called takhif. Takhif. And takhif means to say how is something. So it's impermissible for us to say that, well yes, we have found that in the Qur'an Allah affirms to Him that He sees, but Allah sees in such and such manner. This is for us to say how Allah sees, or to how Allah knows, or how Allah hears, or how is Allah upon His throne, or how Allah descends during the last third of the night, or how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks. The how, we cannot affirm it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, because we have no knowledge concerning that. And therefore, it would be to speak to, about Allah out of ignorance, which is forbidden in the religion of Islam. This is the third thing we must avoid by when we affirm to Allah whatever He has affirmed to Himself or the Prophet has affirmed. The fourth, the fourth uh, uh, aspect, which we must, a uh, fourth way which we must uh, avoid is a tamsi, and a tamsi means to liken, to say that something is like something. So when we affirm for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that He has knowledge or that He sees or that He hears or He's upon His throne, we must not say that it is like Allah's knowledge is like the knowledge of mankind or that he sees like man sees or like he hears like man hears or anything else from the creation this is known as tamthid why? because Allah says in the Quran لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ there is nothing like him وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ and he is the all hearing the all seeing so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negated from himself that there is anything equal like him and then he affirmed to himself that he hears and he sees. So we know from this that he hears and sees in a manner which is not like anything else. Because he first negated from himself that there's anything like him. And then he affirmed that he hears and he sees, so we understood then therefore that Allah hears and sees in a manner which is not like that of any of his creation. Because he is the creator and we are the creation, and therefore there is no comparison between the creator and the creation. And this is also, a tamthil also is known as tashbih, as a tashbih. But there is a difference between uh, a tamthil and a tashbih in one sense, that a tamthil linguistically means to resemble something in every single aspect, in every single aspect. And tashbih means to resemble something in some aspect, but not in every single aspect. And that's why it's better to say tamthil than to say tashbih. Although the scholars use both words interchangeably, so there's no harm in that. So we've now understood, inshallah ta'ala, the, uh, and uh, before I uh, go on, that tashbih or tamthid is two types. The first type is to resemble Allah to His creation, like the Jews have done. They have attributed to Allah all the faults of mankind, of the creation. So for instance, they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, truthfully, as Allah has told us in the book, of, uh, of His book, in the Quran that he created the earth and the heavens in six days. But then they attribute to him the quality of man. They said, well, after he created the earth and the heavens in six days, he got tired, so he had to rest on the seventh day. And that's why they take the seventh day as the day of Sabbath, of rest. Likewise, they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ignorant. And it's reported and they have added into their books, into their revelations, and into their ex explanations on their books that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mankind and saw what mankind was doing from sinfulness and so forth, he became very sad that he made such a mistake and he started to cry until his eyes became wet, they say. This is what the Jews say in their book. And this is Kufa. What do we find in the Quran? That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angel that he was going to create on the earth a Khalifa, and here Khalifa doesn't mean as people interpret vice gerent of Allah. This is, this is a incorrect concept. Khalifa here means he who will be succeeded generation after generation. In other words, Allah created Adam and he will be succeeded by another generation. That generation dies, another generation comes, and then a third and a fourth and a fifth generation and so forth until the end of uh, the appointed time on earth. And we see this ourselves. Our great-grandparents lived, their generation died, and their children came, our grandparents. That generation died, and our parents, 
our parents, as we get older, our parents' generation will die and end ourselves. We will die, then our children, then their children, so forth and so on. So this is what Khalifa means. It means he who uh, succeeded one generation by the other generation. So the angels understood by this, it is said, that if this was going to be the way, and therefore that these people would cause corruption on the earth, and they would cause bloodshed between themselves. So they, they said to Allah, are you going to create one on the earth which will succeed generation after generation and they will do much corruption and bloodshed on the earth. Allah said, I know what you do not know. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew what man was going to do. He was aware of that. But the Jews have resembled Allah to a man and therefore like ourselves. You might do something and you don't know what the result of your action is going to be. You take a decision, you don't know what, how it's going to turn out. So they say, well, Allah created the creation. Then was surprised to find the creation sinful. So it became saddened and started to cry. So here they've resembled Allah. And I get two examples. They said Allah created the heavens and the earth in six days. And obviously the creation is a great thing. So they said, therefore he must have gotten tired. So he took the seventh day off to rest. And likewise they say that, you know, he created mankind, put him on earth. But was unaware what mankind was going to do. Saw mankind sinful and became saddened. Distressed. Now, this is one type of tashbih. The other type of tashbih is tashbih of resembling man to Allah, giving a person of mankind the qualities of Allah. Like the Christians. The Christians, when they come to describe Isa and the Mary and Jesus, son of Mary, they give him the qualities of Allah. They say that he's all knowledgeable, that he was eternal, that he hears everything, he sees everything, and that's why, therefore, they deify him and they worship him. So, tashbih has two types, and it must be both types is kufr and must be avoided, disbelief. It's uh, good to mention here that uh, the first person to introduce this concept of tashbih, resembling or giving man the qualities of Allah, was a, uh, a Rafadi, a Shi'i, known as Hisham bin al-Hakam, who was in Iraq. He was the first one to do this. And likewise, the first one to deny the names and attributes of Allah was al-Ja'ad bin Dirham, who was also in Iraq. And in Iraq, usually, and the land to the east is usually where all the uh, fitna occurred and all the uh, stray sects usually popped up from. And this is why the Prophet says in the Hadith of Bukhari, um, he was sitting with his companions and he said, Oh Allah, bless us, Alexander. Bless us in our Sham and bless us in our Yemen. Sham is that area north of Arabia, which we now call Syria and Lebanon and Palestine and Jordan, this area north of Arabia. And bless us in our Yemen. Bless us in our Yemen. Yemen is to the south of Arabia. The same area as the country is now called Yemen, about the same area, geographical area. One of the companions said, and bless us in our Najd. And another narration, and or bless us in our Iraq. The Prophet remained silent. And he again repeated the dua. Oh Allah, bless us in our Sham and in our Yemen. And the man said, And what about our Najd or our Iraq, O Messenger of Allah? And then a third time, and then the Prophet pointed towards the east and he said, It is from there where all the fitan or the turmoil and the zilazin, which are the earthquakes, will occur. So, the Prophet ﷺ condemned that area and explained that from there the corruption in the Ummah would occur. Now, those Sufis, this is just a side point, this is the topic, I just want to point it out. Those Sufis tr- take the one narration which says Najd to use it as an indication to condemn the da'wah of Shaykh Muhammad Abdul Wahab. Because Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab appeared in Najd and he said, Oh, you see? The Prophet ﷺ said he was silent in Najd concerning Najd. And therefore, this is this da'wah. The Prophet ﷺ meant this man and this da'wah, these Wahhabis, and therefore, don't listen to what they're saying, and so forth. That's okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to come to that as well. But this is an incorrect interpretation. Because in the narrations of the hadith, some of the narrations say Iraq. And that is because the word Nej literally means any place which is of high elevation. Nej actually means of high elevation. And the Arabs, used to call Central Arabia Nej because it's high elevation and also used to call Iraq Nej and that's why in one narration of the Hadith it says in our Iraq and this was stated clearly by Ibn Hajar Ibn Hajar in his commentary in Sahih Bukhari Fashul Bari 
said the, the meaning of those narrations which mention Najd, it means Iraq. Iraq, as the other hadith mentioned. And therefore, it is not the meaning of Najd, meaning in, in Central Arabia. Ibn Hajar, of course, lives how many years before Ibn Abdul Wahab? At least, huh? At least three and a half centuries. At least three and a half centuries. So there's no way you can claim that he was influenced by his da'wah or supportive of his da'wah and therefore made this up, this, you know, put this in the commentary of Sayyid Bukhari. No. He, you know, Ibn Hajar lived in the year 800. He died 800. Um, his student Seals, he died 9-11. Ibn Hajar died, I think, 852, if my memory serves me correct. And Ibn Abdul Wahab died in the year 1206. And we're now in the year 1414. So between the two men were almost three and a half centuries or so. So he clearly stated that. So this is just a good point because you'll find that these uh, Sufis, you know, and they come in different stripes and colors these days, uh, usually use this argument. Usually use this argument, you know what I'm saying? They say, oh, these Wahhabis and so forth. And here the Prophet ﷺ has condemned them by this hadith. And they're ignorant of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and they're ignorant of the interpretation of the hadith, and they try to use this argument to, uh, you know, use it as some sort of indication. And that's the Dawah of Shaykh Abdul Hab, which was a reformative Dawah calling people back to Quran Sunnah as a false Dawah, and they try to say the Prophet ﷺ foretold that. So that's just a side point. The point is, is that the first person to appear with the belief among the Muslims which to deny Allah's names and attributes was al Ja'ad bin Jirha, who appeared in Iraq, and the Muslim governor of Iraq of the city of Waqlis slaughtered him uh, during the Eid al Adha prayer. And he said, he gave, because in those days, you know, the Amir of the Muslims, the leader of the Muslims was not just a political leader, but also was a scholar. So he would give the Eid khutbah and lead the people in prayer and so forth. So he was giving the Eid khutbah and he said, oh people, slaughter, because Eid al-Adha, slaughter, and may Allah accept your offering. I am going to slaughter as Ja'ad bin Jirha. Because he has denied that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, and has denied that Allah has taken Ibrahim as his khareed, and then he came down off the member and cut his, his neck. And likewise, the first one to uh, um, uh, say that Allah is a man among this ummah was a Shia, a Rafabi, and his name was Hisham bin al-Hakam, who appeared also in Iraq. So both of these false beliefs appeared in Iraq. The other point is um, concerning is that we must also avoid al-Ilhad, concerning Allah's names and attributes, and al-ilhad is what? Ilhad literally means to, to deviate. To deviate. And ilhad concerning Allah's names and attributes is four or five types. One type is to either deny Allah's names and attributes. Just to deny them. And that's ta'at, ta'atil. Ta'atil as we mentioned. Or to resemble Allah's names and attributes with those of his creation. Which we said is tamthil or tashbih. Even though tamthil is a better word to use. Or to to derive from Allah's names, names for one's idols. Because as Ibn Abbas said, the pagan Arabs took Allah's name, Allah, and they made a feminine derivative of it, and it's called it Allah. And likewise, they took Allah's name, Al-Aziz, and they made a feminine derivative of it, and they made it Al-Uzza. And likewise, they took Allah's name, Al-Manan, and they made a feminine derivative of it, and they called it Manat. So this is also Ilhad. And likewise, from Ilhad, is to name Allah with a name which he has not named himself with. Like to call him Father. Like the Christians do. The Christians call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Father. This name has not been mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, this is something very important to uh, bring out also to side point, but concerning Father. The name Father. Some of, somebody might then ask a question. Well, we find in the previous scriptures, at least in the English translation, what's remaining of those previous scriptures, we don't know if it's been corrupted or not, they refer to Allah as Father. How can we understand this? You're saying now that to call Allah Father is ilhad. So, the ulama have differed concerning this. Some of the ulama say that the word Father in the previous scriptures is equivalent to what we call now Rabb. What we say Rabb in meaning. Or Lord. And this is the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah. This is the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah and others. Because the word Rabb, right, means to raise, okay, and much like the word Father in this sense. And therefore, in this sense, 
that when the prophets previously, Ibn Taymiyyah was trying to explain, and how do we explain the, the existence of this in the previous scriptures? In a sense, would we say it up? Now, can somebody then therefore say, well, if it's found in the previous scriptures, I can call Allah by this? Because we know that the Dua, the Prophet he says, Oh Allah, I ask you, by every name which belongs to you, which whether you taught one of your creation with this or you revealed it in your scripture, so can we then therefore uh, use this hadith to say we may refer to Allah now as Father and so forth? The answer to this is no. As a Zahabi quotes Ibn Khutayba in his book Al Ulu, mentioning that this term, even if we were to say for the sake of argument, or that we come to the conclusion that this was previously used in the previous scriptures, in our sharia, it is impermissible for us to use it. Especially, more so, especially after the Christians have perverted this meaning to mean as a father in the, um, in the uh, physical sense, you know what I'm saying? That he actually gave birth and so forth, and they twisted this meaning. So therefore, that this is an example of now it had to call Allah by this name, Father. Okay. So therefore, Ilhad in Allah's names and attributes, we said, is four sides, either to uh, uh, to either to uh, deny Allah's names and attributes, or to name Allah with what He has not named Himself with, or to uh, derive a name of take one of Allah's names and derive it from the name of one of the idols, or in that case, to make up a name for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We have now understood, inshallah ta'ala, now we come to the second principle, the second principle of the, uh, the second part of the, the principle of Ahlul Jama'ah, and that is negation. We said that we negate from Allah whatever Allah negates from Himself, or whether the Prophet negated from Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the same time affirming its opposite. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the Quran, uh, in Ayat al Kursi, that neither sleep nor slumber overtakes them. So we negate this from Allah. Allah has negated from Himself that sleep or slumber overtakes them. But is it just sufficient for us to negate